So in areas like Takwa in the western region, Atiwa in the eastern region, and of course Obwasi in the Ashanti region, mining environmental to has reached a crisis point. Rivers, once used for drinking, now run yellow. Forests face destruction, and young people are forced to choose between short-term gains and a sustainable future. But the question remains, can Ghana truly balance mineral extraction and environmental preservation? We'll put together this to illustrate the point. So the MPP and the NDs, they, they've all made uh, promises and they've committed to what they will do to ensure sustainable mining in the country. And according to Dr. Baumia, who is bidding to lead the country on the ticket of the MPP, uh, the, his plan is to ensure the application, processing, and line system of small-scale mining ends at the Minerals uh, Commission. And we'll, we'll, we'll get to know well, he wants to scale up the use of Mercury free gold catch up machine technology for profitable and as well as sustainable small scale mining. This is part of the MPP's approach to sustainable mining that is, if elected to continue in 2025, also aggregate and utilize reclamation fund to implement land reclamation programs. For the NDC, they want to wage a war against the use of cocoa farms for illegal mining or galamse activities and want to what want to reclaim degraded cocoa lands such that such lands can go about to uh, be used as cocoa farms and amongst others they want to ensure that mining operations are not conducted in unapproved areas such as water bodies and and that the concession holders rehabilitate impacted areas and also want to facilitate equipment financing and mining input research standardization, good recovery, optimization, and post-mining land reclamation services. This is part of the NDC long-term plan to deal with the mining sector especially. And of course, you've also heard similar pronouncements from the likes of Alan Kujo Chamantin, uh, Hassan Ayariga, and all those who are contesting uh, in the December election. We've got two experts who help us tackle this today. Dr. Charles Jemfi Ofori is policy lead, climate change and energy transition. Uh, Dr. You're welcome. Thank you. Great. And of course, Nana Mwesi, the fifth executive director of the Institute for Energy Security, IES. Uh, these are the watchdogs who have been monitoring our mining sector, tracking climate change impact and holding successive governments accountable. We'll be examining the political promises against reality. We'll also be looking at the real cost of mining in our forest reserve, the truth about community benefits from mining, the connection between our mining practices and climate change, and of course, the possibility of truly sustaining the mining practice as we have it in this country. So let's start uh, on this very important discussion. Uh, let's start with Dr. Charles Jenfio Ofori. Dr. Ofori, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Also. So first let's talk about, I mean, the, 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 the discussion about illegal mining, for example, has been ongoing. First of all, let me find out, in terms of government's commitment in the past, and even what they are promising to do now, we really think that they've been more committed to ending illegal mining before we come and talk about the other matters. I think it's a, it's a bigger conversation that we really need to have as far as illegal mining is concerned. And it's really an issue around our ability to enforce um, the laws that, that we have because mm. I mean, you can take a look into our minerals and mining acts and other regulations within the, within the mining sector, and you see that there are a lot of provisions that have been made to curtail the incidence of, of illegal mining. Um, it goes beyond just, you know, mining without um, a, a license. Mm. Even if you have a license, you need to follow the laid down rules and practices of, of, of mining. And mm. all of these things are provided and enshrined in our various laws and regulations in, in the mining sector. Okay. I think that it's, it's, it's really an issue of how we are able to enforce some, some of these regulations to make sure that those who mine are not mining in um, reserves, uh, mm. for instance, they are not mining in water bodies. And then also they are undertaking the needed reclamation um, purposes that or reclamation activities that they need to undertake. So 
the issue of reclamation shouldn't have even been, you know, a bigger manifesto promise mm. in my in my estimation because it is a, a legal provision. It is something that you, as a mineral rights holder, needs to have. And and when you are done with your exploration and your production, you need to leave the space in a way as you came to mm. to, to to meet it. Right. So, that, that 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 shouldn't be like a whole a bigger promise that you know a political party or wants to now now do. It's, uh, it's really perhaps, perhaps it's because need to enforce it. perhaps it's because the environment is so degraded that it becomes a matter of a promise Ex exactly. and to fix it. Ex exactly, that is that is the 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 sad reality we are, mm. we, are we are facing now, and and I think that I mean the the issue of legal mining has been there, you know, from successive governments past mm. and the the will to really, really deal with it had not really been there. I, I, I'll come back to ask you about how did we get here? But let me allow uh, Nana Nanamwe see his preliminary comments on the matter. We don't have him yet. We'll bring him on when we have him, then we can uh, have him speak to us on what he makes of the issue that we are discussing this afternoon. But uh, Dr. Fori, so how did we get here? I mean, I've been, I've been reading a lot about illegal mining. Clearly, it started way before even Ghana gained independence. So it's been with us from even before the creation of the republic. But how did we get to where we are now that it is so topical that it is, it is probably the reason why somebody may even lose the upcoming elections? I think, I think there are a lot of factors. Um, first of all, we can look at the influx of um, the... At one point, we were talking about Chinese invading our small scale mining mm -hmm. space. And suddenly the conversation shifted even beyond the Chinese invading it to our own, you know, um, people now invading the space. Realizing how lucrative the, the enterprise has, has become, um, people com comparing a, a, a value of gold to other you know, um, like say to, to cocoa or mm. to any other agricultural produce. Mm. And they saw a lot of value in, in engaging in, in illegal mining, mm. or mining without a license or even undertaking mining without the needed, you know, structural or um, environmental safeguards. So the, the gains, the potential gains that they are supposed to get out of it is, is really what they are, they are, they are, they are seeing and, and they want to really um, do whatever they want to do. Mm. We, we, we visited a community some, some years ago, okay. and we interacted with some young people, and they told us that in this community, you either become a teacher or a nurse if you go to school. <laughs> and when they see the life of, uh, and the gains, the livelihood of, of some of these um, professions, and they see the life that um, a Galamsey operator is, is living, they seem to look at the fact that, okay, this person gets a lot of economic benefits from, mm -hmm. from it. So that incentive to do it irrespective of the, of, the, of the dangers, even with the environment, the dangers with themselves, even going under the, under the pit has been, has been shrouded with the, with, the, with the kind of money that they feel or they, they, they intend to. So, 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 that so, is so, one point. Or so lack of job opportunities may not necessarily be the main issue. I think it's a bigger there's there's, there's that bigger incentive for for people to to now go into into it and it's it's now developed into we even getting hearing of a lot of you know political influences and political actions mm. making illegal miners feel so protected that that you know there is no way it's, it, it becomes very difficult for some of the laws that we have to be to be enforced and because clearly some of the politicians are themselves involved and owning, and owning mining concessions as well. News around, mm -hmm. around holding mining concessions. And it's not just a matter of holding mining concessions. You see, holding a mining concession will not be against, against the law. But the, the practice of, of, of the mining itself, is it, is it a legal approach that you are, you are, you are taking? Um, are you doing the necessary, are you giving the necessary safeguards as, as prescribed by the law, as prescribed by the Minerals and Mining Act and, mm. and their um, attendant um, regulations. All of these things dovetail into the kind of things that we are seeing. And I think it began to generate a lot of attention because we now see 
the the evidence of of what is happening on our on our water bodies we see the devastation it is causing mm. and i think one bigger thing was about the the press release that the ghana water um, company made giving us the kind of reality sense that we reality check that we needed to see that if we do not tackle the issue mm -hmm. it is really going to be a canker for us and imagine ghana importing you know our, our water, a source of water in, in to, to drink and, and all the things that comes with it. The attendant environmental impacts, not just for those who are living in the mining communities alone, but also for even people who live, you know, kilometers and hundreds of miles away because of how interconnected our water bodies are. Mm. That's, that, that reality is, is quite shocking and we needed to have that kind of organized, you know, approach to push the, the actors to deal with the, the kind of menace that we are facing. All right. Nana Mwesi joins us in the studio. He's from the uh, he's executive director for the Institute of Energy Poli Security. Nana, you're welcome. Thanks for having yeah, me. Yeah, always a pleasure to have you on the yeah. show. And uh, I mean, it is, it is not surprising that mining and how to mine responsibly has become one of the issues that is driving this December 7th presidential elections. And I was just saying that somebody may lose the election because of perhaps the way the, the comments and how they've conducted themselves in terms of addressing this issue of illegal mining. Before we get into the, into the issues, your, your preliminary comment on why has this become so a major campaign to as we head towards the elections? Well, I, I think you chose the words carefully, uh, mining, responsible mining. Yes, of course, um, whatever is on the ground, as, um, by the name, by its own definition as a mineral, uh, it's a great resource to the country mm. and to the citizens. And for that matter, they will want to uh, tap into that mineral. But how responsible have we been? And uh, unfortunately, Gallam say it's not something that came to us uh, a few years ago. No, in fact, way it before was Ghana was formed. Exactly. But then we've not had this sort of, or extent of devastation uh, in our water, water bodies and in our grounds. And so if somebody has to suffer for that, then it means that the person has not been responsible mm -hmm. in checking the miners, checking the citizens who want to, you know, make gains from the mineral. I'm sure we'll keep on mining as a country. And so, um, there is no contest and there is no issue about whether we'll mine or we'll mine. We'll still mine. Mm. But how responsible would we be? And how responsible has the government been over the years? What have been their actions and inactions? What have been their own comments? Even when they are mining in forest reserve um, and, and irresponsibly, you get people go to their defense right. that they are doing right. Mm. And so if somebody have to suffer for some of these things, so be it. Mm. Let, 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 let's focus on the real cause of mining in our forest reserves. I mean, when organized labor threatened that nationwide strike, among the demands was that government should take steps to revoke LI, uh, the LI that allows mining in forest reserves. The president took action. He directed the, 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 the Minerals Commission not to grant any more licenses for people to mine in the forest reserve. And when parliament came back, the process for the airli to be revoked started but it, for now because of the issues in parliament it hasn't taken any more step beyond the fact that there is some kind of commitment from the side of government to have it revoked why would a state or a country grant first of all license for people to mine in forest reserve knowing very well the implications it will have for our for, for, for our future let me start with dr Fori. i think it's quite um incredible to to hear or to even see that in the in the first place, um, where you know from a very diversity um, perspective, we know how important some of these reserves reserves are mm. um, to us. And and I think the real question was whether we had even um, we were done with mining in other parts of the of the country mm. that were not you know labelled as, as 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 forest reserves or protected zones and. It was it was really quite surprising that the executive as well as parliament could even think or to to say that 
let us let us allow this to even run through us and then get the approval in the in, in the face. In fact, there was no opposition to it when the LI started traveling the 21 days maturation period, and then and then and then it became a lot subsequently. And, and until and until we began to blow the whistle and make you know a lot of um, statements concerning this this issue, it it would have seemed that it was it was okay for us to for us to do so. And surprising, here we were going to COP16 in, in Cali to go and do a bi biodiversity com com conference. Mm. Whereas we are here doing, um, providing, doing the same law mm -hmm. that allows us to mine, to hit the kind of biodiversity that we are going out there to go and hold conferences over. So that was quite um, intriguing and, and surprising um, on, on both, you know, executive and then delegate. But for you, what really is the real cost of mining in, in forest reserves? I think those, those are protected areas that we need to continue to, to protect as far as our biodiversity is, is, is concerned. And um, we need to make sure um, when the last gold is taken away and, and the last fish is eaten, and the last tree is cut, we realize that we cannot eat money. Right, um, that balanced approach to, to let us know which areas are, are, are supposed to be mined and which areas are not supposed to be mined is very important for us to, to take note as a, as a country. And it's not everywhere where we believe that the land is bare, the land is available, that we need to, we need to mine. There are certain areas that we really need to protect to ensure that we do not you know, harm the, the kind of um, biodiversity, the kind of environment that we want to actually do. Those, those, those things come together to protect our own, our own environment. And those are the safeguards that we needed to, to, to have. And I think the most basic of, of all forms of prevention was really to ensure that those areas that have been marked as forest zones, protected mm -hmm. areas, are not going to be touched when it comes to you know, mining. But Nana Moesi, I mean, look at gold and the kind of remnant gold can bring us. We, we, we've been running around taking loans, five, sometimes $5 million, $10 million. The IMF has given us $3 billion. And look at the conditions attached to it. Imagine government has, or the state has access to all our gold resources and then mining it, and all the money coming to the state coffers. I'm sure that I would have paid all our debts and will become so much, uh, will become so much sustaining. What that tells me, for example, is that if we are able to exploit the mineral resources in a way that is sustainable um, and then we adopt a responsible mining, the benefits will be bigger. We can also leave the gold in the forest, however, or the impact that will have on our economy. So how do we go around this? Well, uh, I, I worked as a miner uh, between 1996 and the year 2000 in Obuasi. Mm -hmm. Obuasi have mined gold for centuries. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, um, and ask me, what is the state of Obuasi today? What is the state of Takwa today? And so um, mining in itself is not generating that much revenue. And it's not bringing that development that we all envisage. Mm. If you want to really gauge it, look at all the locations or the locality that they mine gold. It ends up being deplorable they end up being at the disadvantage end and poorer at the end of mining because I'm sure we've not laid the right structures and strategies to go into this. Most of the mining done on Lasky, for instance, are done by foreigners. Of course. And so we just take peanuts at the end of the day. How we put ourselves together to have a national mining company and go into that uh, domain responsibly and mine. Then you ask, into forest reserve. Um, my brother laid it right when he said, we have not exhausted what we have in unprotected areas. Why do we go to protected forests? And by its own name and definition, forest reserve mm. means that at a reserve for a purpose and to hold biodiversity. Some of our clean waters passes through this reserve, are filtered and comes to join some major streams which we end up consuming by drinking. Mm. And so when you mine in these areas, you are polluting it from its very source. So the tail end is what we are seeing currently at Wager, right. right? the result we're seeing. And so it disturbs the water bodies. Some 
uh, you know, species are also kept safely there around water and clean water. If we disturb it, we disturb our own, uh, you know, course. The next is that the forest reserve holds many trees. And if we understand what tree does, they consume or they absorb the carbons we emit. Mm. So they are carbon sinks. When we cut them down and bend them, that's when you burn a tree, you see smoke. Right. Because it's holding all that. If you're cutting it down, then it means at the end of the day, um, you are generating so much carbon and you don't have a place to hold it. It go up into the skies and what do we see? Global warming, climate change, and its resultant effect that we see. And so uh, for us, and particularly as a person, Nana, you don't go into such areas at all. We hold them as sacred. So what, we, we, we should just leave it as it is, when we can exploit it. Have you the exhausted budget? the other places? You have not exhausted it. And you have not shown that you, have, you can mine responsibly. Why do you come to a forest reserve? Dr. Fo, you don't see any way around this? I think, you know, it's, it's a bigger issue um, around how we even manage the, the gains that we are, we are getting from, from the mining. Um, if we, we have some, some revenue management frameworks, Nana spoke about how even the, the local communities are not really benefiting. We'll, we'll, we'll come to that. We'll come to that shortly. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, so I think that it is a bigger conversation on the, the scope of mining that we are having, um, where we are venturing into, which areas need to be um, delinked from, from, the, from the activities of mining, and then how we also manage the, the gains that we are getting from mining. And then how we are enforcing the miners to ensure that how they came to miss the land, they leave it in that same, in that same way. Mm. So it's a bigger um, conversation on that. And once we're able to you know, put all of that and tie all of this in, even the concerns as to whether we should, or the argument as to whether we should enter protected zones will not even be, you know. But, 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 but a key question on this for, 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 for you, you, Dr. Furi and then Nana. I mean, Nana, you are into the oil sector as well we do understand that even for for for, for country ghana and our oil production is is dwindling it's going down we are we are not developing more wells and even the companies that show an interest to invest in our oil sector some of them have packed out and they've left the danger for me is that in some few years we can move we don't develop more wells we are we are likely to run out gold has been with us for about 200 300 400 years isn't it the case that perhaps there should be a nationalistic approach to mining to gain the maximum benefit that is there? That's only the point I, I made initially, that we've not made that conscious effort to nationalize some of these uh, minerals for our own sake. And we always have to rely on uh, foreign entities to come and mine our gold, mine our oil, and our own national stake is just what we take as um, uh, participatory interest and all that, even in the oil industry. Mm. Up till now, the GMPC have not been able to become that, uh, you know, flagship company or gain that operator status to uh, hold a stake or probably a world and generate its own production. Um, then aside that gain some other taxes for government and all that. We've not been able to do that. Same with good. So probably going forward, we should begin uh, to look at policies that will guard against unnecessary intrusion by foreign Because I, I remember when Newmont wanted to sell the Achim mines. Yeah. And then the only comments we heard from governments, and in this case through the, the, the Minerals Commission, was that government was really interested in Newmont, uh, Newmont having a local component okay. in the sale such that Ghanaians may play some some limited role in the mining sector. Then Nemo sold the, the mines to a Chinese company mm -hmm. at a billion dollars. Is it the case that companies like SNITS, even the Minerals Fund, couldn't have put together a consortium to buy it? Yeah, it's possible. We've never taken advantage of our own local content policy. We are just at the fringes of it. It is just what we want to, you are the major uh, coming into the country and you have to have a local partner 
And how much does the local partner get? 3%, 5% mm. stake in that. Mm. It doesn't make it um, really much of a local content as an approach. So we must have a, a, a policy, a strategy, a framework that ensures that Ghanaians are also in the activity and are playing key roles. And they could rather go and look for partners who have minority stake. To give it to a Chinese, let's look at even this uh, lithium that we're seeing. Mm. We have a mineral uh, investment fund. Right. We are willing to take part of that money and invest it into the business of Atlantic lithium. Why can't we build our own capacity? Mm. What does it take to mine? We have Ghanaians who are holding machineries for foreign entities to rent and mine. What's it so much different? My, my boss, uh, Sir uh, Jonah, mm. I work under him at AGC. Uh, I think around 1998, as uh, my ship boss. Look, there is that experience Ghanaians have. We also have the machinery and all that it takes to go into mining. But I'm sure when I cut a deal for you, my brother, black like me, mm -hmm. I don't know why we can't trust ourselves and we can't feel comfortable around our own people, but we feel comfortable giving this to Chinese who we'll call our friend than ourselves. So we must have a you know, deliberate approach going forward. But Dr. Fori, I mean, looking at the state of Obuasi today and popular mining towns like uh, Takwa, if you look at the state of these two towns, is it enough to conclude that indeed mining hasn't benefited the country as it should be? If you want to cite an example like Johannesburg? I think um, we need to perhaps now begin to unpack those, those, those conversations. Um, I, for once, um, do not have much of a, a problem when you are allowing um, foreigners to come in to undertake mining activities, whilst you also um, build the capacity of your own to, to undertake those, those activities. Um, the, the key word is proper regulation mm. of, the, of the activities for both locals and then, and then foreigners. But back to, your, back to your question, it's really about, you know, how we now distribute the revenues to ensure that those revenues meet the kind of needs that our, our people would, would, would want. Mm. Um, we've seen from the fiscal data that mining revenues actually form um, just around 10 to 12 percent of our um, domestic our domestic revenues. And that is quite you know, huge con right. considering the, the kind mm. of economy that, that we have. But the bigger question now is how much of that revenue goes into those local communities, given the kind of fiscal regime that we, we have. If you take our revenue structure, the, the amount that goes to support those mining areas is just the 20% of the royalties um, that is shared among the mining districts that goes through mm -hmm. the Minerals Development Fund to be distributed to those mining districts and then those mining catchment areas. Um, for, for some of these districts, as you mentioned, like Takwa, like Pristia, Obwasi. like you know, Kenyansi and, and, and those other districts, you realize that those funds are really, really important sources of um, revenues that they use for their, for their, for their development. And when, when they come, it's because also this money seems to come to replace other sources of revenues when those revenues are not coming in, then it means that they are, they are left with only those monies, uh, you know, and, and some few monies that come through the DACF and then, you know, other IGFs to actually augment the development process that they have. Now, a challenge that they are facing is another new law that seems to cap the MDF portion that should even go to the district. So in 2017, we had the earmarked funds capping and then realignment act that provided the Minister of Finance the discretion to actually cap you know, some of these statutory funds that mm -hmm. are, are, so that they can use the excess to do other, other things. When you, you track the, the performance of the Mineral Development Fund, which will be 20% of our mineral royalties, you realize that over time, about 10 to 12% is what goes you know, to the fund to be distributed to the, to the community. So, if you have a district whose population size is huge, whose land mass is huge, and relies solely a lot you know, on, on the MDF funds, 
because your DACF is is capped as source. By the time it gets to the district, it's delayed. And in fact, the, 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 the head will even buy everything you exactly. need for you. Then Whether you want it or not, the money will be deducted. There is so much pressure on that fund to be used for the kind of development that you intend to, to, to have. So those challenges is, is what we, we see at the, at, the district, you know, at the district level. So the kind of development that you want to see when you go to, say, Takwa, and you hear the volume of gold that is coming Of course, there, every, every year. And you want to see the kind of development that is, you, you, you do not see it. Because the companies will tell you that they pay taxes to government. They are also in business to make profit. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. They owe, I mean, we did a period that they are supposed to work detected by the alliances. Yeah. They, they are, they, they've invested. They need to recoup their investment. Yeah. They pay taxes to government. Government decided to not spread the tax across the country for development because the fact that the tax is coming from Obas doesn't mean that all the money should go back to Obas for development. Exactly. So the money companies cannot be blamed 100% for, oh, for the course. state of affairs. Yes. So, so the monies are distributed. And then some are supposed to go to the district because of the of the processes that they go to because they also incur the benefits or the um, the impacts of the of the of the of the activity, mm. you know. In, but where the monies are not enough, where they are capped at source, <laughs> you know, then it would not be enough to meet. And you see, another thing is even the inability to track. And some of these, some of these monies, um, some goes into we, the burden of policies to and stuff. Them to, to, to ask them, okay, d how much did you expect to get? And there is no idea of how much they even expected to get. The, the kind of thinking around how, when the money goes into the pot, how do we notice that Obuasi gets this, Takwa gets this, Pristia gets that, right? So that they should be able to track those you know amounts of money so that they can get what's what what is due them maybe mm. as a basis of their production or any other you know level it is it is quite difficult but, but in other words, how different is the ghanaian situation from places like south africa that is there's this there's this this huge gap in terms of development for the communities hosting the mining companies probably we have to go and understudy that uh it could be a whole uh thesis mm. uh, or research that somebody might want to understand why should it be so. But I think that uh, for our end here, um, we, we don't even, the local community itself doesn't understand um, the business that's uh, is surrounding them. All that they get is being employed and they being able to sell, uh, you know, petty petty trading to the workers. They think that's all the business. But then if they understand uh, what an ounce of gold is, how much is being sold on the world market, what the production levels are on monthly basis to the end of the year, they also be informed, be in an informed position to tell how much um, the company is generating by way of revenue, forget about their costs and all that, but at least it gives them a fair idea how much is being paid to government by way of royalties and taxes and all that, and what by, by design and by legislature, how much is time to get from the money that um, come to government, mm. how much are they supposed to get? The district assembly or the community's own stake in that. Very important. But the communities largely are uninformed. And so we believe that that's where some of us have to do more advocacy uh, so that we let the people community understand. Sometimes they even struggle as a company mm. to, to to win the community on their side, because now this seems to be on the, on the, on the, on in a position which means that, or which shows that we are being blinded from our own resources. We don't know how much they are taking away and how much comes to us. So education here is very, very important. And of course, advocacy will lead to that education, then tracking, transparency, tracking of all those resources and results published by government will also give a fair idea of what we must expect from government given all those resources that they gain from the miners. So, so who should take the ultimate blame for the slow pace of development? Is central government? Who, who have we chosen to lead? We elected a government. If we can do it by ourselves, uh, we won't have elected uh, a government. Mm -hmm. And so the backstop of the government, they are in a position to help us for all that. At least, even the district assembly, the localized one, is administered by the central government. So governments have to, uh, you know, 
answer to some of these things. Right, so we are looking at sustainable mining and of course responsible mining. And we are looking at the pros and cons and how best we can make it better, especially as mining has become a major tool for the 2024 December 7th presidential and parliamentary elections. My guest this afternoon, Dr. Charles Genfiofori, Policy Lead, Climate Change and Energy Transition with A7, of course, Nana Amoesi uh, from the uh, uh, Energy Security uh, Energy Security Institute for Energy Security. Now, is there a connection between climate change and what we are experiencing now? And to what extent will that have effect on our lives going forward if the status quo does not change? When, when you um, assess climate vulnerability, um, countries that are largely vulnerable to the impacts of, of climate change, you realize that African countries and Ghana is, is one of those vulnerable um, countries. Mm. And it's also because of our key agrarian you know, economy, because the impacts of climate change has a lot of impact on our agriculture you know, produce. Um, talk about fish stock talk about you know um, farm produce and, and and all of that now there is the bigger concern the macro level concern about the climate and its changing weather patterns and how it impacts on agriculture mm. but there's also now the direct impact of the activities that we are having like the galaxy we are talking about and how it affects you know um our our um, agriculture and and some of the livelihoods that you know we we, we are supposed to to have and then the cost that we are we are incurring in in purifying water and in doing all the things that, that we need to so it is it is on two ways the the bigger impacts of the of the climate and how it impacts the um, our our livelihoods mm. especially regarding agriculture and then also the other impacts how the the direct impacts of the unsustainable mining practices have on the on the farming so if you take a typical farmer living in, um, let's say, a mining community, that farmer faces a double-barreled problem. Mm -hmm. the, the problem with climate change, the changing weather patterns and how it impacts on their produce. And then the second one is the, the, the dangers that unsustainable mining would also impact on you know, the, the kind of the, the land that they are using, the, the production that they are having, the lands that are being taken away from them. And, and, and all of those situations that they face. So, uh, I, 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 I say, as we bust the two together, I mean, uh, the threat of climate change and how devastating it may have on our lives going forward. And now that we don't appear to have a handle on stopping illegal mining, it was something that would take years for us to handle it, so it will still be ongoing. I, I have just been thinking, it's an idea that perhaps, I don't know how feasible that can be. Now, for Cocoa Board, the law is that all cocoa farmers sell their beans to cocoa board. Can't we streamline illegal mining or small scale mining to the, to, 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 to the level where perhaps all of them sell their go to an entity like happens in the cocoa sector so that you can track, identify them, monitor them and watch what they do? Is it not possible? Well, I'm not sure we are monitoring what, uh, what cocoa producers are doing. We only resource them to produce more cocoa. Okay, but here is the case. We are mining irresponsibly, whether small scale or illegal mining. You want to say that all of them should sell their gold to government. Mm. The first point we are discussing here is that we must ensure that they are mining responsibly. Mm. It's not about how much they are getting today or what, how much government will get. It is harming our environment if we don't mine responsibly. If you choose to go into a forest reserve and cut those trees, it means that the carbons have no place to go and settle, okay? The absorbents have been taken away. They have to go into the sky, mm. forms a blanket up there. The heat that needs to go back to space, go and hit that carbon, uh, that blanket. And so between us and that blanket in the sky is heat, right. okay? And it's changing a lot of things. This is global warming. When it warms, it changes our weather patterns. It changes how much the temperature we have been enjoying over the years and many others. If it changes the, uh, the, the, the rainfall pattern, for instance, it means that we cannot predict where it's going to rain and how much it's going to rain and how it's going to support the growth of our crops. 
it breeds, uh, you know, when there's no much harvesting of our food, it breeds anger. Mm. And that can even generate into other tensions politically. Mm. When people are starving, you know what it brings. And so the first thing is, look, let's ensure that we are mining responsibly and let's ensure that we are mining in a way that does not impact negatively on our climate so that we don't end up bearing the brunt of climate change. Mm. Food security is threatened. Right. Human settlement is threatened. Rainfall pattern is threatened. But lives are threatened. Lives are threatened all over the place. So today, I want us to be so much fixated on how to mine responsibly and protect our forests, protect our water bodies as people. Mm. And Doc said, what happened if you get all the money? Can your, your money buy water when water is non-existent? I think we are getting to a point where every Ghanaian must be concerned what's happening in the space and ensure that whether NDC or MPP, we, we put government on the toe such that they ensure that regulations are followed to the health. Every law and every act has been made already. Any, everything that we need to protect our forests by way of law and act are existing. Uh, There's because, the enforcement. Because we bring in the NDC and as we begin to wrap up, You've heard all of them, from Dr. Baumia to Mahama to Alan Chematen, and all those who want to lead this country in 2025. The, 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 the diagnosis and solution, are these the ones that we need to bring sanity to the sector? Well, uh, for the end, this is manifesto. It gives me some hope that the, 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 the act that was uh, signed by parliament a while ago that we can mine the forest with reserve, they will make sure that they reverse it. It gives me much hope. In fact, the, the process has already started. I mean, maybe, but for the, for, for the, for the, for the stand of in Parliament. If, um, if, if the MPP is able to get this off Parliament, mm -hmm. with the support of NDC members in Parliament, um, I hope to give them some consideration. Mm -hmm. Dr. Fori. I think that um, Nana mentioned a very important issue about the fact that these are not new laws. These are um, issues that have been written and has been backed by, by law and has been approved by, by parliament and codified into, <laughs> into law. And some of, some of the things that we see are, are just, you know, the rehashing of what the law actually, you know, entails. just that they are, they are, they are, they are being, they are, they are giving new names. Right, so if you say restore Ghana initiative and, and, and all of that, they are, they are reclamation processes that the law should, should actually have, right? So it is really a, an issue of regulation and enforcement, you know, that um, irrespective of what government is in power, ensuring that once we make sure that whether large scale or small scale or community level mining, is able to now follow the dictates of what we have we have outlined in the law and all the attendant regulations. We should be able to, you know, mitigate this 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 harmful effects of of, of of illegal mining. Right. We'll pick up this conversation after the elections to see how best we can make this work. By that time, of course, we will know who uh, will be the, the president of this country, and then we'll put uh, their plan to bring sanity to the sector to to to, to better scrutiny and demand timelines for you know, uh, to achieving the, what, what they've said that they will do in the center. Dr. Charles, Jen Fiofori, Policy Lead Climate Change and Energy Transition. Thank you so much for coming to you, Doctor. And of course, our very own Nana Amoesi, Executive Director of the Institute for Energy Security. Nana, thank you so much for coming through. We'll take a short break right here on the pause and return with more on the show. You're welcome back to the pause. This is your election headquarters. And of course, the Electoral Commission beginning today is just to route him the ballot for both the presidential and parliamentary elections across the country under uh, a secured arrangement. Now, it is starting uh, here in the Greater Accra, and then in the days to follow, it will be distributed to uh, the, the other 16, 15 regions. Let me take you live to the venue for the distribution process for the Greater Accra version. And my colleague, Michael Papani, joins me. So, Papani, uh, Michael, uh, tell us about this program for the, the, the distribution of the ballot and how the EC is hoping to store it securely.
Hello, Elton. We are coming to you live from the regional headquarters of the Ghana Police Service. This is the Greater Accra headquarters of the Ghana Police Service. And this is where the this will be the holding center for all ballot papers and voting materials of the Electoral Commission. It will be held until December 7th when they will be distributed to the various um, localities and the various polling stations from which it will now get to the various places where the voting will take place. My name is Michael Ashale and here we'll bring you up to speed on the exact processes that is happening. On face value, it looks like a very chaotic process. But if you look at the individual groups and what exactly they are doing, then you will appreciate the importance of the work that they have to do. Due diligence has to be done at the political headquarters today or they risk losing the elections. A lot more things can happen on election day if this particular process goes wrong. So what you see in your shot right now is agents of the political parties and the electoral commission going through the bags of every constituency. All the voting materials will be embedded in these green bags. These ones have been properly named. This is for the Greater Accra Region Kole Korote Parliamentary Bag 3. As exactly, you can see the seals there. There are four seals in total. There's one from the Electoral Commissioner. There's another from the NDC. There's another one from the MPP. And there's a final red one from GCPP. We are told that only three political parties took part in the sealing of the bags that contain the polling materials or the voting materials for all these um, areas. So this is a little what is happening. So they have to break the seals, first of all, and then secondly, open every bag, check the contents. In some of these contents, you realize you have the ballot papers, and these ballot papers are in different types. We have those that are 100 sheets, there are those that are in 50 sheets, and those that come in other numbers. So you have to take every one of those out one by one, and then you check. When you are done and you are satisfied with that particular bag, then you reseal it. And that is exactly what they are doing. We can listen in. 153489. That is easy. NDC. 153224. 153224. NPP. A0 39947. So you just heard him mention at least three serial numbers for the various seals that will go on every bag. Every bag is unsealed when it comes from the printing house, comes to the Greater Accra Regional Police Headquarters, they break the seal, then they check the contents of the bag, and then they finally do another resealing with the different serial numbers on the various seals. So that's exactly what I've been called out. These are three uh, that have happened. They came with four, but you only seen only three seals at the moment. Is, is there any particular reason? GCPP didn't partake in this process? Yes. So GCPP is not here. Okay, so the clarification we are getting for why the bags came with four seals, first from the Electoral Commission, another from MPP, another one from the NDC, and then the final red one from GCPP. Well, after the verification of the content of the bag, they are only being sealed with three seals. We are told that GCPP is not partaking in this particular exercise. So only three will remain. But every one of those seals with a unique serial number, these parties will check and verify these serial numbers on the day of the final distribution to the polling station to ensure that the bags have not been tampered with. I tried to find Leslie, who represents the NDC, and then another for the MPP side. But it's a very uh, chaotic process on the face value, but every constituency has reps from the various political parties that are diligently going through the contents of the green bags one by one, or the risk losing um, count of what is happening. So they have to check, even for special voters, the content of it has to come to them, and then they check one by one, then they go ahead. Uh, I'll be looking for Leslie to interact with him briefly on what exactly um, is happening. So every constituency has to go through, the, through this process. For every constituency, there are separate groups of people that have to do this. The electoral commissioner, uh, the, there are representatives from the Electoral Commission who are also supervising the process and helping the political parties understand what the process is. So you see some of them with their booklets, writing out the various serial numbers of every booklet, where it starts from and where it ends. Usually that's what, those are the most important things. So you see them there with a the booklet, they open one of the booklets at least to check the content of it. The first page, the serial number, and then the last page, the serial number. Record all of those. These are all quality assessment checks that the political parties have to do to ensure that 
the process is foolproof. At least they trust the process up until now. These ballot papers will be dispatched from the various political from the various regions. I understand as well. Let, I'll try to walk you through what will happen at the various regions. This is just for the Greater Accra uh, region. So, just to walk you through the process, the Greater Accra region. We understand that this hub started at 12 noon and will be taking place. Or was already taking place on Thursday, the 14th of November, 2024. Now, on Friday, 15th November, 2024. Central region, western region, Savannah and Upper West region will also be dispatched from the various sprinting houses to their final destination. Uh, let me try and find Leslie. Leslie, Leslie. Oh, no, so, no, no. Let, go uh, let, me, let, me, let me start with you, oh, Leslie. No, you with no, oh, let, let's, no, Leslie, we are trying to wrap up here. So we are trying to wrap up on the process. I know that you are, you are busy trying yes. to monitor the process. Yes. Uh, and it looks cumbersome, but definitely a work that you must do at the end of the day yes. to ensure that the process is foolproof. Uh, Leslie, I want you to introduce ourselves to our, our viewers. Yes, my name is Leslie Nicole Nim. I'm the secretary to the Greater Accra Regional Elections Directorate, and I'm super, uh, supervising this project entirely. So, Leslie, I've tried to, I've tried to explain to our viewers what the, where the process starts from and where it possibly may end. From, from your end, the NDC, what really are you looking out for? Oh, we want to monitor the election from cradle to grave. We want to make sure that every part of the election process is monitored and it's in compliance with the provisions of the law. And that is what we started today. So we've moved the ballot papers from the printing house. We've brought them here. We are going to check the details and then we lodge it in the police armory. And then a day or two before the election, we check it again and then we distribute it to the polling stations and the various constituencies. Interesting. So so far, so good. So far, so good. At least we we, are, we we have our eyes fixed on the ball. So we are monitoring every process, and then we are correcting and adjusting wherever there are issues. And that's what we've been doing the whole of today. I mean, so let us understand what really are you looking out for in these particular bags we are looking at the range of the ballots that have been printed we are looking at where the ballots are being sent to and then we are looking at whether what really happens is that once the ballots are printed the our agents will put tax and seals on the bags so we are checking whether the seals have not been broken and whether the ballots are intact and that is what we are doing now before we even lodge it with the police Okay, Leslie, let me, I'll, be, I'll be grateful. Thank you very much. Yes, I understand yes, it's a very uh, big process that you have to uh, supervise entirely. So it's a lot of work that has to be done here at the Greater Accra uh, headquarters of the Ghana Police Service. The political parties are making sure that everything is intact, at least whilst they are going to put them in storage until December 7th when they remove them and then distribute them to the various polling stations. But just to um, let you understand what really is also happening here, this is just for the Greater Accra region. At the various regional uh, centers, they also have printing houses where similar um, process will also take place. So on Friday, 15th November 2024, uh, you have the central region, western Savannah, upper west regions also are moving the ballot papers or the voting materials from the... Uh, printing houses to the various headquarters of their, their various police headquarters as well. Now, on Saturday, 16th of November, you have the Ashanti, Ahafo, and Western North regions also going through the same process. And then, Eastern region, Upper East, Northeast, will do this on Sunday, 17th of November 2024. And on Monday, 18th of November 2024, Northern, Bunu East, and Bunu regions will do this exactly at 12 noon. And then finally, on Tuesday, 19th November 2024, Volta and OT will also undergo a similar process to ensure that all voting materials are intact ahead of December 7 elections. There's a lot of work that must be done, but it's a very essential work as well, that must be done by all the political parties. Else, it could breed chaos. But this is one of the processes that are, it, it, it has been put in place by the Electoral Commission and the other parties to ensure that there's some trust in the system that the printing, there were no issues with it, especially given that the NDC, for instance, has raised a lot of issues uh, with it. So this year belongs to um, Anya Sotom constituency. And again, they have to go through the, the contents of the green bags, and they have to open the various brown box, uh, uh, bags as well to check the contents of it. So this is uh, bag number 46, and they are checking the contents of it from beginning to end, how many papers are within some of those. You have them in batches and in different types as well. You have books that come with 100 ballot papers and others that come with 50. And you have to check the contents of every single 
one of those. So this is us here at the headquarters of the Greater Accra Region Police Service where the various political parties are checking one by one the contents of every bag. So Elton, this is me trying to paint a picture as to what exactly is happening here. Uh, they are hoping to finish this exercise maybe later in the evening because uh, they have to check and double check, break the seal and put on new seals as we heard from the NDC side. Unfortunately, we didn't get the MPP because I've been chasing him around for some time now. Hopefully, let me try and make knee, knee. Okay, is it possible to talk to you now? J just one minute, just one minute on what you make of the process uh, so far, knee. No, uh, I beg you. Okay, me, it's fine. If, if you can't talk, you're live on TV. Oh, okay. okay, that's fine. So, knee cannot talk to us. That's my final attempt trying to get him uh, almost one hour trying to get the side of the MPP, what they make of the process. We have been able to get that. So, um, we have to wrap up here from the headquarters. Uh, regional headquarters of Ghana Police Service here in the Greater Accra region. The political parties are checking everything, inspecting it down to the last ballot paper to ensure that nothing untoward happens. We'll be following the process and bringing you also up to speed. For Join News, Michael Ashale. Thank you so much, Michael Ashale. And of course, the, the, the Greater Accra Regional Police Commander is the scene where the Electoral Commission. Uh, together with the political parties are sorting out the ballot papers for both the presidential and parliamentary elections in December. The distribution is starting today and tomorrow they will be taking them to the regions. They have a timetable for the distribution and uh, as you saw, the process is such that, uh, that it is protected to ensure that on the day of election there wouldn't be any issue of compromise or whatever it is that uh, the parties may raise and for uh, the expectations that everything will go smoothly but let's stay on the campaign trail now because the national democratic congress is optimistic about gaining all nine parliamentary seats in the western north region in the upcoming december election we've just only three days away currently the ndc holds six seats whilst the mpp holds the remaining three you have also MP Kwabena Minta Kando is optimistic about a complete takeover for the NDC in the Western North Region, citing what he described as poor governance and failing cocoa sector under the current administration, which he believes could sway votes towards the NDC. Earlier, the NDC presidential candidate John Domani Mahama accused the MPP of being responsible for the decline of the produce buying company. <laughs> Obetu aba ama ba umia eno chile se enfie wotwe se ya uma se yesi kasem eka uma ma abeda yeso ako chile a ya chile a a chile gana fo e chile se we ni jimu obia obetu ama ba umia ene se ni a esi enfie wotwe se ako chile a chile ye se eka abeda yeso se yesi kasem a se a chess a idea of Waso. And he said, Wolf Waswa, and yet there was our year, they said, our service system. Now, Omokot's nephew, or Suno, and yet a double and a crew, or Suno, a double and a choir, Nipa double and a crew, and your Suno, and their men are so, said, or Hina or Suna, a free choir more a buyer. If you are watching me, I say Ghana for a day in a summer and I so say, your pump or solo, no, 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 And away from that, the presidential candidate of the new patriotic party, the Obama de Baumia, has boosted of the successful implementation of the free senior high school program policy, saying that his government has proven doubters wrong by its successes in results. Speaking at the stakeholder engagement, uh, in Bosom Chain, Dr. Baumia said the free SHS policy, which was introduced by the MPP government in 2017, has been a game changer for Ghana's education sector, contrary to what the NDC preached. According to him, despite all the achievements made in this implementation, the government will do more to improve education in the country. <laughs> Sika sem na sika forma etimiko na ohia forma omo ntimiko na yesu ye ni mse gana ha ohia for doors o se sika fo na ohia forma ntimiko dia enye gana na ye wo problem ye be kai chiri 
and the five being said, Yet she shall be three sechers no, not Obiama Timico Sassini High School. Nana no, yes, she is a bono. Secondary education was a very difficult thing for the poor. That is why the MPP decided to implement free senior high school. We have successfully implemented the policy and we are seeing great results. Our doubters, we have proven our doubters wrong. The NDC didn't believe we can do this, but here we are. My government will do more to improve the free senior high school policy and also introduce new initiatives to make it better. budget. And I had the free SHS, a share budget, and a year share here 2017, a call a year free SHS. And then a few or Chinia, yet the free SHS a bagana, young cola, baco, 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 5.7 million children across senior high school free. Of course, we are political parties and touring the voter region. Nana coming with the account, an independent presidential candidate made a stop at Petroy Market. He introduced the 12 pillars of economic freedom, emphasizing the first pillar in nationalization as key to transforming the economy, stating that by building factories to refine and process local products, the nation would create jobs and generate revenue to fund schools, hospitals, and roads, highlighting. The voter region is attributable uh, mineral wealth values at 190 billion US dollars. The new force leader promised that these resources will be reinvested locally to uplift the region. And of course, still in the region and addressing the people of Agba Gomi as part of its 276 tour, Nana called on them to seize power on December 7th from the old leadership that has held Ghana back. He also painted a vivid picture of the new Ghana. Uh, that the new force and and visages. So uh, I am in the say. So come on, cause I'm here campaign where I'm from the two seven six. So just be cool, be here we gonna ha. And come in share with that. And so I am in the same of Bahame share with. Adia, Adia, Dama Kuma. So we need to do do one. Ah, I am Juma. I Juma na mo pama mo ma mo wa. I Juma na mo pama mo hu me wa. Omo <laughs> There's a market way to say your viral, say your journal, say your tomato, so fact you may have one juma. I bet my juma more about market in the move. I bet my sika more about crony move. I bet my man, your juma, then my mimon, your juma, then your juma, your juma, say juma in the best schools, a mammal, say juma in the best hospitals, a mammal, say juma in the best mukwaya mammal. Now a paya casadia, so a casa of my yo kwaya mawa. Okay, so baby, see what's with my Only Sikano, Sikana and Casawaha, Sikano of Water Ridge, I say, Samu Shapila Cinema, Mumba was a pillar to Avono, a catcher music, a crow of Water Ridge, a hundred and ninety two billion dollars. I am a music. And of course, unless focus on our constituency lens and voters in our central constituency are intensifying pressure on political parties to present clear actionable plans to address their issues, including a resilient economy, a stronger city, enhanced security, and of course, improved sanitation. Carlos Caloni takes us to the heart of Ayahuasca Central for today's edition of Constituency Lens. Are the issues on the heart of electorate here uh, in the Ayahuasca Central constituency as the 2024 election approaches. Today, when I go home, my, my children were coming to me. I normally push them up because I have nothing to make them happy. What is this? Because if we are having a bad economy from four to what? 17 point something cities. Why? What I want to see is, uh, if, you could, uh, if you could remember very well, way back 2016, Bohemia told us one dollar is equivalent to what? Four cities, right? And he was complaining. By now, we share one dollar cry Almost 18 cities. We were in Ghana here when Bohemia came and told us, uh, we are still dollar no say see the no or the kina we are too much the kina my IGP and then dollar no can say it chase you know. So 
said an anadro, a bind by ye, said the papay, shaman at your mark racket. Man at your river and so to our bin to me, ma. Say, 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 man at your dream. Now, says Jesse, said your what's your free education? Me, 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 man, ye be. As to me, sister, mum, when ye be. We are no free education, any light, any suo. If they can stabilize things like stabilize the dollars, reducing petrol and the way the things is going up, if they can stabilize it, fine, you can manage and vote for either NDC or MPP. You see this school here right now? Just look at look at the back here. This was built by under John Mahama. That is the K2. You go under that's K3. It was built by John Mahama. You go, you, you move down here. The uh, K1011 was built by John Mahama. They have built a uh, structure that uh, they are enjoying now. It was built by John Mahama. The main road from Circle to Alajo, it was rehabilitated by John Mahama. From Kotobabi to Alajo, it was done by John Mahama. And people should tell us what they have put up here. What do you have to say to them? By the grace of God, I have Central, if you talk of a constituency that had benefited from the president, I was a Central, our roads about 85% of our roads is asphalt now. 85% of our roads within is asphalting. We have AstroTurf. That is one of the biggest AstroTurf in Greater Accra. Alaju. As we speak now, we are constructing another AstroTurf Alaju North. We have a Panaman 12 unit classroom block, a school at Panaman. It's ongoing. Trust me, look, we are well prepared for them. 7 December, I'm going to be declared the victor. And your mama will also be declared the next president of this country. There's nothing he can do. He can be the chief justice, the attorney general, and the interior, the interior minister. minister. Trust me, you are going to whip him. You are not scared at all the fact that your opponent is the interior minister? We are going to whip him. Well, constituents of the Ayawaso Central constituency have spoken. My name, as well always, is Carlos Caloni. And of course, the full episode of constituency lens focusing on the Also Central constituency. This is our constituency anyway. Uh, we're air at 8 p.m. Uh, tonight on Joy News. Now, the former chair of the Energy Committee of Parliament, Samuel Latachi, has clashed with the NDC, Edward Barr, on the MPP plans to introduce 2,000 megawatts of solar power into the Ghana's energy mix. According to the MPP manifesto, this is one of the surest ways to cut Ghana's dependency on hydro and thermal sources of energy towards cleaner and cheaper sources. The Abuaka South MP explained on PM Express Wednesday that the MPP will partner the private sector to introduce solar into Ghana's energy mix. We, we are very much concerned about the energy mix because half the time people believe that um, um, we should just say we need to import enough fuel have enough gas to have um, these resources generate the electricity we need. But if you pay regard to the natural advantages we have, the power of the sun, or solar power, is one of the renewable uh, sources of energy. We are a tropical nation. I mean, the first show is very clear that one of the, one, one of the um, uh, main uh, pillars of trying to ensure that we have sufficient energy is to um, go solar. And uh, we've captured this very strong in our manifesto. Why is that easy to do? If, if we're able to do a rollout of solar in the neighborhood of 2,000 megawatts, we'll be able to have the lights on. Okay, but how much is that going to cost you? Where are you going to get the funding? Well, right now, if you pay regard to our financial space, we should never discount what the <clears throat> private sector would do to bring it about. So one of the major things we are going to do, by reason of our even current challenges of how we are overstressed in terms of our expenditure and then debt, I mean, everything, the rest of it, this will give the private sector the space to intervene in the energy space. And then and they'll be able to help us with this, I mean, I mean uh, solar issues. A member of the Energy Committee of Parliament and, and also on the NDC, NDC Energy Manifesto, 
uh, Edward Barr described the plan lacking to the since the MPP has no idea what it will take to make Ghana energy self-sufficient. Now, but respectfully, I will say that one of the most insensible things that I have ever seen in the manifesto is the fact that the MPP captured that they will add 2,000 megawatts of solar, that's renewable energy, a, a, a variable, what do you call it, energy source to our system. Technically, it just doesn't make sense. And I explain to you, and I as to how we'll get to uh, getting the lights on. First and foremost, know that there is this in, uh, the intermittent nature of renewable energy mm. makes it such a way that any time you you put up a renewable energy, you must have a corresponding conventional plant to take charge any time they are not able to produce energy. I explain to you. Let's say you decide that you are putting 10 megawatts of solar into the system. The solar will only be available to you from, say, 8 o'clock to, say, 5 o'clock in the evening. So it means that it's not going to be available to you in the evening. Because of the fact that we have not, there has not been uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the technology in terms of power storage has not really gone into its advanced stage yet. What it then means is that you must get 10 megawatts power from conventional plant that will take care of your night. Mm -hmm. And so if you were put, and that's why usually, so usually you look at when you are adding renewable energies, particularly verifiable, uh, what do you call it, uh, what do you call it, intermittent renewable energy sources, you must ensure that your, your grid is flexible enough to take it. Well, elsewhere, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz now leads a minority government after he fired his finance minister and triggered the collapse of the country's three-party ruling coalition. Germany is preparing for a snap election, but it remains unclear how much Scholz can accomplish. In the meantime, until a new government is in place, this begs the question, is Germany in a position to make important foreign policy decisions right now? Here to provide some answers, DW correspondent Emily Lesnar joining us from Berlin. So, Emily, I want to start with the topic of climate, since the climate conference is taking place in Baku right now, and Germany has made significant promises to help in the fight against climate change. Does this domestic turmoil affect Germany's commitment in any way? It does. I mean, Schultz decided not to attend because of the government collapse. And at the moment, we have to remember he's leading a minority government. This means that any meaningful policies will, one, be hard to pass. And two, if they are passed, will have to be passed on an ad hoc basis. Now, snap elections have been scheduled for February 23rd. So you're likely to see a lot of focus on campaigning rather than a focus on how Germany is going to meet its climate goals or how it's going to help finance climate efforts in poorer countries, which is a major theme at this year's conference. And of course, the result of the election could impact its commitments too, particularly if a more fiscally conservative government is put into place. So what about Ukraine? Germany has provided billions of dollars to Ukraine since the start of the war with Russia. How does this political uncertainty impact future funding as well as support? I 
mean, one of the disagreements between Schultz and the finance minister he fired, Christian Lindner, related to Germany's budget for next year. Schultz wanted to suspend Germany's debt break, which limits how much debt it can take on year by year. And one reason was to continue providing Ukraine with the funding that it needs to fight the war with Russia. Now, there's a provision in the debt break law that allows Germany to take on more debt when the country finds itself in extraordinary circumstances, which Schultz believes we are in at the moment. Uh, And he had been pushing for this before Trump was elected president for the second time. But it becomes ever more prescient since Trump had promised in his campaign that he would pull or financially lessen U.S. financial aid for Ukraine. And so, of course, this is going to have a huge impact on other countries that provide funding support for Ukraine because they will have to increase their contributions since Germany is the biggest contributor of all EU members. And let me ask, are there other ways that Trump's second term might impact Germany or Europe's policy, you know, internationally? Definitely. Uh, European leaders have been preparing for the possibility of a second Trump presidency for months, and it seems that now they'll have to put those preparations into place. And Trump promised tariffs of up to 20 percent on all European goods entering the U.S., so it's likely there will be retaliatory trade policies from EU countries in response if those tariffs are enacted. Some have speculated that Trump wants to rescue Boeing, uh, which has faced a lot of, of different problems problems in the past couple of years. So this means that we may have we may see a wave of aerospace protectionist policies from the US that could harm Boeing's EU competitor Airbus. Trump also wants to get rid of a Biden freeze on new LNG projects. That's going to create uncertainty in the EU market. Uh, and Trump also just announced that Elon Musk will be the Minister of Government Efficiency. It's unclear exactly what that role entails since it's never existed before, but in the past Musk has promised to deregulate the tech and AI sector, uh, whereas the EU has feverishly been trying to do the opposite. So will conflicting priorities force the EU to be more bullish or to make concessions that we'll just have to wait and see. And on the other hand, there are some uh, Trump promises, campaign promises that might even be good for the EU, of course, at the expense of the EUS. But for example, Trump wants to get rid of Biden's Inflation Reduction Act that drew businesses away away from Europe and forced Europe to pass a package of its own Green Deal initiatives. Uh, So could some of these businesses move back to the EU? We'll have to see. So the answer to your question, yes, Trump's second president is definitely going to impact the way EU makes policy decisions in just about every area, defense, tech, trade, energy, you name it. All right. Emily Lesnar from our partners, EW, thank you so much for coming to what us, our show for today. For those of you who've been waiting to hear the reasons behind the Supreme Court decision to, uh, to, to, to rule against the Speaker's Declaration of Forces as unconstitutional, the reason is finally here. And it's on my jawonline.com. If you go there, you'll find all the stories. MP seat uh, can only be vacated if they switch political parties in Parliament. That's according to the Supreme Court. And the full uh, reasons provided by the court and that five to decision is on my joy online.com. Well, folks, that's our show for today. Whatever you are up to in the hours ahead, I hope it's profitable. My name is Elton Bobby. Tomorrow, same time Friday, we shall be here with a weekend edition of the post. Until then, stay, stay calm and take care.